Thank you for coming along. Uh, my name is Matthew Hornsey. I'm going to be talking to you today about climate change skepticism. Who are these climate skeptics? What drives them? What can be done to draw them into the fight against climate change? Uh, and I'm going to open by showing you a quote from 965. This is the then US President Lyndon Johnson in a special message to Congress, effectively just ringing the alarm, just saying that uh, the science was already starting to show that the burning of fossil fuels and the CO2 releases associated with that were changing the atmosphere and that this could have dramatic consequences. Um, when Lyndon Johnson made that comment in 1965, the science hadn't yet really fully settled on that, but very quickly um, it did. And we saw these predicted increases in temperatures um, and that those increases in temperatures happened as predicted in lockstep with the increasing CO2 emissions. And 97% of climate scientists agree that that's what's going on. Um, but despite that consensus, there's significant community pushback against that notion. Um, the levels of climate skepticism vary across the world, but I'll show you here data from Australia, which is my country, uh, representative data from six months ago. And if, I guess, from an optimistic point of view, you say, well, 59% of people are saying, yes, climate change is happening and it's caused by humans. Um, but that also means that there's a, there's a lot of people who don't believe that. Nearly one in three Australians say, well, all we're seeing here is natural fluctuations in the Earth's climate. Humans don't really have much to do with it. Uh, or there's 11% of people who, despite 50 years of concerted scientific messaging around this issue say, well, the jury's out. We don't really know what's causing climate change just yet. So effectively, we have four in 10 Australians going overruling the scientific consensus. That's a big number. It's less than it was. And you see this um, across the world, actually, a, a, a dropping off in the, the rates of climate skepticism. But in some countries, and particularly in Australia and America, and some other countries, the, the numbers are still alarmingly high. Why would people reject scientific consensus? Well, one argument is that people just aren't cognitively sophisticated enough to understand the science. They don't think analytically enough, um, they're not educated enough, they're not science literate enough, etc. cetera. Um, if this is true, then the answer is to train people to think more like scientists, to be more analytical in the way they approach evidence. Um, one way to look at this is just to measure education or to measure science literacy. Other people just ask people whether they like to think in analytical ways, um, because some people don't. They prefer more intuitive ways of thinking. Or you give people analytical problems to solve and you've got to try and answer those questions. And I'm not going to say that these things don't matter. We do know that cognitive sophistication matters. Um, the problem is it just doesn't matter that much, and particularly when it comes to big issues like climate change that have been discussed at great length. Um, so if it's a totally new scientific attitude, um, then cognitive sophistication tends to matter. But with things like climate change, the evidence is there, but it's just not very strong. I'll show you some of that evidence in a second. Another argument is that people just haven't heard the right arguments. So uh, from this point of view, you can imagine that climate skeptics, the heads are empty of the right information, and we just have to pull that uh, correct information into people's heads, and then the climate skeptics will be converted. So from this point of view, our salvation is in science communication. We need more of it, and it needs to be better. Um, the problem with this explanation for, for climate skepticism is that there's just not a lot of evidence that it works. Um, you know, sometimes myth busting and, and uh, education programs do have small positive effects on the attitudes of climate skeptics, but frequently they don't. Sometimes you get these reverse effects where people become even more climate skeptical, which doesn't seem to make a lot of intuitive sense. Why would information not transform people? Um, well, one answer to that question is the third major explanation for climate skepticism, which is motivated reasoning. So, you know, when we talk about evidence and information transforming people, we're relying on the notion that people behave like cognitive scientists, that they're actually 
weigh up that evidence in an even-handed way before they reach a conclusion. So that's what scientists would do or what scientists are supposed to do that. Um, but it's a lot of evidence that suggests that for many people, they don't really behave like that. They behave more like cognitive lawyers. So from this point of view, they've got a conclusion in mind. They've got a preferred outcome and they're gonna selectively critique the evidence and selectively remember the evidence and selectively expose themselves to the evidence in a way that helps them reinforce that conclusion that they wanna reach. So that quote on the left is from the Simon and Garfunkel song, a person hears what they wanna hear and disregards the rest. That's effectively the principle of motivated reasoning. And people are very good at it. And so if you see the world through the lens of motivated reasoning as, as I do, <laughs> The question pivots. The question is not so much why would people reject the science, but rather why would people want to reject the science? Well, what is their motivation to reject climate science? And that's a, a question that Kelly Fielding and I were grappling with when we came up with this metaphor of attitude roots. So it's a simple tree metaphor. Um, we designed this to apply to a whole bunch of scientific attitudes. But um, above the surface, we have the surface attitudes. These are the attitudes that come out of people's mouths, the actual arguments they express, whether it's about climate science, vaccines, evolution, et cetera. And of course, it's very tempting to focus on what people are saying with their mouths, and most people tend to focus on surface attitudes. Of course they do. Um, but what we're arguing is that you should try and focus instead on what lies underneath the surface things that are often unsaid. And this is what we call attitude roots. And these are the things that motivate the surface attitudes. These are the things that answer the question, why would people want to reject the science? It's the attitude roots that give the surface attitudes strength and make them resilient, even in the face of contradictory evidence. And if you read our work, you'll see that we talk about a whole bunch of attitude roots down there, like worldviews, social identities, anxieties and phobias, best interests. But what I want to do today is really talk about ideologies because this is the one that seems to be most relevant to our discussion of climate change. And when we talk about ideologies, we often talk about free market ideologies here. So with the free market ideology, people are saying, well, I don't want governments telling businesses and telling individuals what to do with their lives. Like people prefer small government over big government. They don't want to see a lot of regulation. And for people who have that worldview, climate science is sort of a nightmare because in many ways, the solution to climate change does imply a big government response designed to regulate the activities of individuals, but more importantly, to regulate the activities of business. And so if, if you find that a morally toxic solution, then people are more likely to want to reject the science, right? Rather than coming on board with the solution that that science suggests. How do we know these things play a role? This is the results of um, a meta-analysis um, that my colleagues and I did. A meta-analysis is where you take a whole bunch of studies from around the world and mash them together to get a bird's eye view of what's going on. And what we're trying to do here is to predict um, belief in climate change. So these uh, numbers are correlations with belief in climate change. The further away from zero, the bigger the correlation. Um, and you can see that things like free market ideology are very important here. To the extent that um, you believe that markets should operate in an unregulated way, you're less likely to believe that climate change is real. Also, there's other ideologies that are relevant. Individualism. You know, where do you stand on the rights of the individual versus the rights of the community? Uh, more individualistic people are less likely to believe in climate change. Hierarchialism. Do you think that hierarchies are normal and natural parts of life? Or are you more egalitarian? Or well, hierarchical people tend to be less likely to believe in climate change. And it's fascinating that these ideological variables do so much work in predicting climate skepticism because they don't refer to climate science, they don't refer to science at all. But they outpredict a whole bunch of things that you'd expect to be highly relevant like extreme weather experience. Have you personally experienced droughts or floods of extreme weather events? If you have, 
you're more likely to believe in climate change, but the effect is tiny. People with high levels of science literacy and educated people are more likely to believe in climate change, but again, the effects are much smaller than these ideological variables. You see that also come out um, in the demographic literature. So very small effects of sex and race and income. You've seen that education effect. Younger people are slightly more, more on board with climate change. Um, uh, but the biggest predictor, the thing that blows everything out of the water is political affiliation. Who do you plan to vote for? Do you have a conservative political orientation or a more left-wing political orientation? So when we're looking at these kind of effects of worldviews and ideologies, I'm mindful that probably half the samples that we used in that meta-analysis were from America. And that made me nervous because I was thinking, are we telling a universal story here about conservatism? Or is this an only in America sort of phenomenon? Um, so we collected data from all around the world. And I, I apologize in advance for this very complex uh, graph. But it's telling a fairly simple story. So what we're doing is we're looking at a whole bunch of correlations between political conservatism and climate skepticism across 20 something nations. Um, what you're looking at there is correlations. The further to the right of that vertical dotted line, the stronger the relationship between political conservatism and climate skepticism. And one thing you can see is that actually for many countries, probably three quarters of those countries, there's no reliable relationship. There's nothing inherent to political political conservatism that makes people reject the climate science. Um, it's interesting to look at those countries where the relationship is there, and it's much stronger in America than anywhere else. Second strongest is my country in Australia. And we did actually notice a pattern around the countries that showed this relationship. It tended to be um, very fossil fuel reliant countries with high per capita carbon emissions. And countries where the stakes are high, you tend to see this relationship between um, conservatism and climate skepticism. Okay, so let's pivot and talk about what can we do about this. Um, if I'm right, and that a lot of the rejection of climate science is a case of motivated reasoning, um, people wanting to reject the science, then just repeating the science is missing the point. It's probably not gonna work out. Um, some people have used the metaphor of shadow boxing when people are arguing about climate change, you think you're arguing about evidence, et cetera, but really it's about something else. And possibly you've had that experience where um, you're having uh, a, an argument with a climate skeptic trying to persuade them, and you feel like you're just killing this argument because you're coming with you know, all these great pieces of evidence and data, et cetera, landing one killer blow after another, but the other person doesn't change. They're, they're not being converted. You know, I would say that that's perfectly predictable because it's missing the point about what's driving the skepticism in the first place. In terms of knowing what to do about this, um, Kelly Fielding and I use a different fighting metaphor, um, which is around jujitsu. Jujitsu, judo, these types of martial arts teach people not to take on people's force directly, but to work with their momentum. So if you're a lightweight person, you can still defeat a heavyweight opponent if you use their force against them. You can use momentum, leverage, gravity, et cetera, to win the fight. And I use this as a metaphor for persuasion. Let's don't try and just mash data on people's faces and pretend that their underlying motivations don't exist. You've got to try and work out what the underlying motivations are and then come up with messages that align with those underlying motivations. And if you do that, it'd be amazing how much resistance goes away when you're kind of swimming with the stream as opposed to trying and swimming against the stream, if you know what I mean. So what do we know about climate skeptics? Who are they? What are their values and their worldviews? They're more likely to be conservative, particularly in high carbon emission countries. And so what do you do? You use language and you use messages that appeal to conservatives. It's a very pragmatic approach. What would that look like? Well, there's plenty of studies on this showing that if you frame climate mitigation as an act of national security, which is the theme that conservatives are particularly interested in, then you tend to get more success in capturing their attention and, and getting them to be more pro-environmental. Sometimes people can frame climate 
mitigation is a way of protecting a way of life, protecting the status quo. You can frame it as an act of patriotism. I've got data showing that if you frame it as something that's going to trigger green technology and green jobs, um, then conservatives are more likely to listen. Some people have shown that if you talk about it as an expression of personal responsibility, this is a conservative value, um, people are more likely to listen. Uh, more so than the traditional frames, which typically around themes of environmental harm, themes of justice. These are kind of traditionally left-wing moral foundations. By the way, there's also evidence showing that conservatives are more likely to accept climate science when they're led to believe that there are free market friendly solutions to it. This comes back to the free market ideology point. Um, remember, they're not rejecting the science, they're rejecting the solution, which in their mind involves lots of government regulation. But if they're led to believe that there can be free market friendly mechanisms to try and uh, reduce this problem, they no longer feel the need to reject the science, right? Because the solution is not as toxic for them. One last message as well is that um, we have to understand that if you're trying to influence a particular group of people, it's better if you use messengers who come from that group. Um, these messenger effects tend to be very large in my experience, um, but if you're trying to influence conservatives, um, then they're more likely to be influenced by other conservatives than by people on the other side of the political fence. We see this with the urban rural divide as well, that farmers, people in the country, tend to be more influenced from organizations that are rural organizations than from urban organizations. Um, I would be very reluctant as an Australian to be preaching to the rest of the world about how they should operate to defeat climate change. Um, I think one thing that the data teaches is that sometimes you have to step away from the microphone. Um, and that myself, for example, as a left-wing um, urban environmentalist with certain values, um, might be less effective than some other people in terms of sending this message. So we have to be smart about what we're saying, we have to be smart about how we're saying it, and we have to be smart about who is saying it, the who is very important. So this is my last slide, just take home messages, kind of reinforcing what I was saying. Don't feel as though facts are gonna be enough. Evidence won't necessarily be our salvation. Many people have heard the evidence, they just want to reject it. You need to understand your audience. Never imply that skeptics are stupid or poorly educated. You shouldn't do that out of politeness, but also because the data suggests they're not stupid and they're not poorly educated on the whole. Always scan for underlying motivations and fears that might be driving these attitudes and driving more skepticism about science. Use in-group messengers whenever possible um, and wherever possible. Try and frame your messages in ways that appeal to what your audience values rather than starting from your head and projecting attitudes outwards. The whole principle of communication is that you start from your audience's head and work backwards. So we need to have you know, we need to be pressing buttons that are important to the people we're trying to persuade, not pressing buttons that are important to us. Um, thank you for your time. Feel free to contact me on email if you've got any questions. And here's just a little review of some of the um, uh, some of the the articles that I've been talking about today. Thank you very much.